This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly. This episode of Know How is brought to you by Braintree. Mobile app development can be complex, but integrating your payments no longer has to be. With Braintree, your business can accept nearly every type of payment from any device with just one integration. Learn more at braintreepayments.com slash knowhow. And by DigitalOcean. Simple and fast cloud hosting built for developers. Deploy an SSD cloud server in 55 seconds. Try it today for free. Visit digitalocean.com and once you sign up, be sure to enter the promo code KNOWHOW in the billing section to get your free $10 credit. Today on Know How, your projects are screw-ups. Welcome to Know How, it's the Twitch show where we build Ben Break. And upgrade. I'm Father Robert Ballas here. I'm Brian Burnett. And for the next 30 to 45 minutes, we're going to be showing you some of your projects that we took home and screwed up on our own. <laughs> we didn't re really need any help doing we that. We didn't, but no. But, uh, we figure we'd try. It was fun. <laughs> yeah, well, we haven't done this for a while. We know that uh, normally we do feedback on Mondays, but some of the feedback is kind of technical and it more properly deserves to be on a Thursday episode, a build episode. So we put a bunch together. And uh, it's going to be your projects and what we think we can do to improve them, which will probably ultimately break them. <laughs> By improve, you mean probably setting on fire, yes. right? Yes. Fire's yeah. good. Yeah. Fire. You know, I've made fire. Fire hurt. How about that? <laughs> uh, let's go and start with the first one. Uh, we actually do have a really good question that we, this, we've got all the stuff on the table for because it is an off-asked question, which yes. is where do I get my power from? How do I, how do I drive the projects that I've created from the know-how notes. Right, and it's one of my favorite things to tinker with, which is LEDs, because yes. you know, blinky lights and everything. Yeah. Uh, but this question comes from our G Plus group, and it's from Jason. He asks, I'm trying to power a string of 300 RGB LEDs in the Arduino that runs them. The power will be split to the Arduino and to the LEDs so that the Arduino isn't powering the LEDs. I've got a bunch of old power adapters with output voltages higher than the five volts I can use for the task. How do I convert some volts into amps to power everything? Okay, so this came from our discussion uh, about amps versus watts versus volts, right? Right. So basically, w West Virginia. West watts Virginia. equals volts mm -hmm. times amps. So in order to get the same amount of watts, I can either increase the volts or I can increase the amps. Right. Yeah, that, that's, that's okay. how it works. What he says is he's got a bunch of adapters that probably provide between 7.4 and 18 or 19 volts, like, right. uh, like a laptop adapter. And he would like to use that to power uh, a strip of WS2812 LEDs. These mm -hmm. are the ones that we've been playing with a lot on know-how because 5 volt is the sweet spot. It's the same voltage as the logic on an Arduino or right. the Intel Curie board. So why wouldn't I use that? But is it would 300 LEDs be a little bit to it push that? It could be. And let's do the math here because this is important. Remember that every single one of these WS2812 LEDs, so actually if you go to the overhead, Alex, uh, each one of these segments is a different LED, but every LED is actually three LEDs. Remember, it's RGB. It's oh, red, right. blue, and green. And every single one of those is going to draw current. Now, Even if it's not showing, if it's not emitting Well, no, I mean, depending on how bright it is. Oh, okay. So, for example, uh, I, I did some quick tests. Uh, the red is typically going to draw up to 9 milliamps. Okay. So at full brightness, it's going gonna, it's gonna to pull down about 9 milli milliamps. The green is one of the most power-sucking lights. <laughs> it's actually going to pull about 11 milliamps at full brightness. And blue is uh, actually the most power-efficient. It's going to pull about 5 milliamps. Okay. Right. So when you turn to complete white all the way up, so that's level 255 for red, blue and green, mm -hmm. you're going to be pulling somewhere around 25 milliamps per LED. Per LED. Okay. Right. So if you've so got a string of 300 that are that. pulling point to, uh, uh, 25 milliamps, you're going to be pulling about 7.5 amps total. Okay. Okay. And that's not something you would want to be pulling through the Arduino. Not Well, no, no, absolutely. The Arduino cannot supply yeah. that. So if you try to power that off of the Arduino, uh, what you'll see is you'll see the lights dim and then it will just stop working. 
because you destroyed it or it just if shut itself down? Hopefully not destroy. If it's a super cheap Arduino, it probably has no electrical protection <laughs> and yeah, you will blow it. <laughs> okay. Um, but I mean, you just can't. Yeah. Uh, we have, we have. I think the most we've powered off of an Arduino is probably that ring of 32 LEDs, which you can oh. do mm -hmm. because we use like rotating colors. And so it's never completely bright white. So we're not ever pulling max. Right. Uh, now, I, the numbers I'm giving you, those are, those are max current draws, and that's assuming that every LED is doing steady, full, bright white. Right, which you always want to plan for the max. You right? do want to plan for the max just so that if you hit that, because you don't, you don't want to program failure into your project. You don't want to say, well, we're fine, unless you turn it all white and then it melts down. <laughs> right, exactly. That's, that's kind of bad. Okay. Okay. So, but there's another issue, and that is... When I start looking at strips like this, especially if I'm going to be combining them, because this is a strip of 150, I kind of like this because they're all weatherproofed, mm -hmm. but I can link many of these rolls. In fact, there was a story I read this morning. Someone made a banner out of 6,000 WS28120 LEDs, just like these. Wow. Um, which is nice, and they're all daisy chained, but I mean, think about how many, how many rolls that is. You're pulling, like, what, 300 amps. Uh, this won't take it. Yeah, okay. You, you will melt the interconnects. <laughs> uh, if you try to provide power from just one spot, luckily, WS2812 LEDs care about the digital in and digital out. So they're only one side. So only this side can have the digital signal coming in because mm -hmm. every LED, remember how it works. So if I have 150 LEDs, it means I have 450 bytes in the array. Right. Every LED is going to take three bytes, one for red, one for blue and one for green, and, and that then tells, pass it. and then pass the rest back, right? But uh, even though the digital data has to come in one direction, the voltage can come from either. It doesn't matter. Oh, it doesn't care. Okay. Right. That makes sense. Exactly. So what we're going to do, if you go to the overhead again, Alex, we are actually going to provide power from both sides. Okay. So if we were to imagine a giant banner full of LEDs, you could be powering it from a bunch of different. Precisely. Locations. So if, if I were to make a banner of LEDs, what I would do is I would daisy chain the digital. So I had just one really long mm -hmm. uh, array because that makes it easier for me to make animations. It's all one big array. Right. But I would provide power at like every junction. That makes sense. Cool. Yeah. yeah. And what that does is it keeps me from putting an insane amount of current from one side of the string. And, and you'll actually start to see at 300 LEDs, you probably wouldn't see it. If you did two strings of that, 600 LEDs, you will start to see things like the LEDs towards the very end are either really, really dim or they just won't work at all. Mm -hmm. Or, really popular, if you see brown, it means, yeah, there's just not enough power. It's, oh. It just looks bad. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, luckily, this is actually not that hard. I'm going to show you some devices that you can use uh, and uh, some devices that you can use to convert your voltage down to the 5 volts that you need for WS2812. Okay. Okay. So, first of all, this is my personal favorite. <clears throat> You've probably got a bunch of spare power supplies lying around from old ATX cases. Yeah. Uh, and this, this is a mini ATX. Oh, you've seen this on the show before. Um, what's the close -ups, closest camera we have, Alex? Is, uh, yeah, that there we one. go. That one. Oh, okay. Pull, pull back here. So I've got a jumper. And that jumper is actually just a paper clip that I bent. Uh, and you can look up for the, the instructions on this. I think we showed this off on uh, like episode 78 of Know How. If you put that jumper there, when you connect power to the power supply, it automatically spins up. It doesn't wait for a signal to power up like a normal right. ATX power supply will. Yeah, because otherwise it wouldn't have a connection and it would just... It would just sit yeah, there. Yeah, sit so there. you'd have power connected, but it would never turn on. Right. Um, that jumper will mean that anytime you connect power, it starts up. Right. But the nice thing about power supplies like this is, first of all, they're regulated, so you get nice, clean power, but also you get a 12-volt and a 5-volt rail. Okay. Yeah. In fact, it even says all power supplies will list what they have. So if you look on, if you look on the side here, uh, this will provide you multiple rails mm -hmm. at 10 amps, 11 amps, 8 amps, and 0.5 amps at these different voltages. Cool. So we have a lot of wattage, a lot of power that we can pull from this power supply. We just have to make sure it's in the right voltage right. for our application. Now, the nice thing about this is it has a 5 volt rail, so I don't have to play around with anything else. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, the original poster, his idea was he has a bunch of different voltage adapters. How can he use that to power the 5-volt rail of the LEDs? Okay, so I'm guessing you have some sort of thing that passes the power it's a through? magical device, Brian. Yeah. It's magical. It's called a UBAC. A what? A UBAC. 
You you back what? Uh, yeah, it's a, <laughs> you back up what? <laughs> you back? You really? Ba- you back? You back? Now, uh, UBEC stands for Universal Battery Eliminator Circuit. Oh. Yeah, so this is what they look like. Um, I bought a bunch of these for about $3 each on eBay. Don't ask me for I, I'll put a link in the in the show notes, but the problem with doing that is an eBay auction, there's no guarantee that that auction will be we'll still, still going be on. There. So we'll just give you the, the yeah. title that you should search for? This is a Turnigy UBEC. And all it does is it will take anything. See this, if you here, you can hold on to this. This will take anything between I think 2s and 6s. And that's how many cells of lipo you have. Mm-hmm. And it will convert it down into either five or six volts. So yeah, it says three amp max five or or max five amps. Right. So the, in other words, right. three amp is what it's rated for for continuous use. It can burst up to five amp if necessary. Hmm. Okay. Okay. And uh, yeah, these these are actually really cheap. If you buy them in bulk and they are incredibly useful, I can take pretty much any voltage I might have. You know, it's down from 7.4 all the way up to like 28 volts, and it will convert it down into five or six. It doesn't matter, it doesn't care. As long as it's above 7.4 volts and below 28 volts, it will push it down into five or six. It sounds like magic, Padre. It is magic, kind of, but not really. <laughs> uh, because what, okay. It, okay, here's how, it's a linear UBEC. So what it will do is it will take any voltage source Mm-hmm. And it will just turn it on and off a bunch of times to get to the right voltage. And then it uses a series of, uh, of filters and a capacitor to kind of smooth out the voltage so that your device connected on the other side doesn't blow up. Hmm. So if I wanted to, say, put LEDs in my kitchen, like underneath the drawers, would I use something like this? And then yep. could I plug into the wall and yep. somehow? Yep. <laughs> so, so actually, see, what, where I use these is uh, a lot of my devices are 5 volt, but it's actually more efficient to push higher voltages. Yeah. So like 19 volt over distance is far more efficient than 5 volts over distance. Mm-hmm. So I will have this connected to multiple points and then I push 19 volts to the entire string mm-hmm. and it down converts at the various points that I need th- that voltage. I see, okay. It, cool. And again, I avoid having to push a massive amount of current yeah. down the LED string, which would burn out. Burn out. It would cool. kill it. Yeah. So let me show you how this works. Uh, this isn't the greatest example because I don't have another string to daisy chain, so I can't make it 300 LEDs. I can only make it 150 LEDs. Hmm. But luckily, I've already modified the code that we use for the cyberpunk, uh, the steampunk uh, glasses. Sweet. Um, and uh, I'll show you what I did in just a bit. But first of all, let's let's show you what we have on the table. We have this. This is our string of 150 WS2812 LEDs. Uh, I think I got I got this on eBay for something like $22. Nice. Uh, not bad, and actually it, it works. Uh, we did have a couple of people who said they bought their first lemons from eBay. So again, uh, once okay. you find a good source. Stick with it. Stay with it, yeah, okay. it, it's, it's golden. Uh, we do need to do one thing quickly. We need to identify input and output, not for the power, because remember, power I can put from either direction. Right but for the digital source. Easiest way, and unfortunately you can't, I don't think you can zoom in here, actually maybe you can. If you look here, one side will say D-I-N, digital in, and one will say D-out, digital out. Do you see that? So this side is digital in, that side is digital out. So the the data always runs this way. And also, normally, if if they're well done, you'll see an arrow, and that arrow tells you which direction the data runs. Okay, and then, so which wire is it that the data is on? Uh, So it's the green one. Yeah, uh, this is is confusing. Uh, Unfortunately, this is the setup for most of them. Uh, They don't believe in black. Uh, White is actually black. So here, these two aside, that's voltage. So this is where I need to put my five volts and my ground for the five volts. Okay, that makes sense. Over here, this is where I need to put ground. So white is ground. Mm-hmm. Green is my digital data. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't is... need to use red. Just right. ignore red. Because you're going to be powering Over not here. from the Arduino. Right. Got there it. we go. Okay. So that's my in and my out. Now let's look at this. You've seen this before. This is our little breadboard. Uh, so what we've got is we've got an Arduino Uno. Uh, but I could use any Arduino. This, this, this programming will work on the tiny little postage stamp, the Nano. Nano. It will work on this and a breadboard. So I'm going to use one potentiometer because just like we did with the steampunk goggles, I want a way to change the animations. Right. Uh, the original code that was uh, was created by, oh, I can't remember his name, but, uh, I, I, oh, my, Mark Kriegerman, all it does is it cycles through animation. So I modified it so that it will take a value from the potentiometer 
right. and use that value to say which animation it wants to run at any given time. Cool. And then you can also program in brightness and right. So that's why I could, I could do that switch. with the second with the second potentiometer. Right. The other thing that I've done is I've added two functions. So he did a bunch of bunch of functions just to to show off the power of the uh, of the fast LED library. Mm -hmm. I added one for fading to black. So no matter what animation it's running, it'll just <laughs> fade to black. And the other one on the other side of the potentiometer is pure white. So it takes all the values and jacks them all the way up to 255. So right. you get as bright, pure white as you can get. Cool. OK. So let's set it up. If you go to my, my screen here, Alex, you'll see the initial code. Uh, and yeah, go full screen. So there's a couple of things here that, that we need to know. Uh, you can change this, of course, but I tried to make the code as flexible as possible. The first part is the data pin. Mm -hmm. Just like it sounds, and just like we did before, that's the pin on the Arduino that I need to connect to the digital in on the WS2812 strip. Right. So that's, that's the one that's going to be te pushing that, that uh, array of bytes out to the, uh, the mm -hmm. strip. That's where it's going to come from. The second number you have to take a look at there is pot pin. So this is the, uh, the, the, the pin, the analog pin, that it's going to be looking at for the voltage coming off of the wiper on the potentiometer. That's right. Uh, and actually, Alex, if you go to the side here, You'll see there's three. You see there, there's, there's three positions. One, two, three. Because, yeah, right? Because So positive, negative, or either way. It doesn't matter. Right. That center pin is connected to the wiper, and that will change voltage between, the po between zero and whatever the positive is. And that's the range. And that's, that gives yeah. me my range. OK. So let's go back to the code. That gives me my analog pin and my digital pin. The next part, you don't have to change at all, WS2812. Uh, you might use WS2811s or 2812Bs, but mm -hmm. it will work with WS2812. So it, you would just have to change the number right. then? And yeah, just okay. the model number. But the next one you're probably going to have to play with is this, 32. So this is still currently set for our steampunk goggles, right. which only had 32 LEDs. We have 150 LEDs here, so, so just, 150. just change it to 150. Right. And down below is brightness and frames per second. Uh, you, you can play with this. Uh, I like to keep it at 100% brightness. Mm -hmm. If I was going to add the second potentiometer to allow me to change brightness, I would actually make this a variable instead, rather than a hard-coded number. Right. Yeah, right. A variable that would then set a loop for checking what the potentiometer is at, like, Right. setting wise it, just like i did for the uh, digital potential uh, for the uh, the digital uh, assignment mm -hmm. so for the animation i would just have a function that checks it looks at it makes a range for it and then lets me set brightness according to it cool yeah and actually i'll show i'll show you what that looks like down below because i'm not going to do that on the show that's your homework. You're going to take that home and play with brightness. Actually, that's a, the project I want to do. I want to set that up in my gotcha. kitchen and be able to change the brightness and also change what pattern or color it's Can using. I going to tell you a secret? What? We're doing this question because you asked about that. <gasps> See, <gasps> It's par partially my project, It's bro too. love, man. It's bro love. Boom. 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 <laughs> All right. All right. Let, let's, let's get to business. So we know that we need to hook up our breadboard. Uh, so that we're using this potentiometer. We know that we need to get data pin off of seven. Right. We know that we have to get analog in on zero. zero. Uh, and we know we need to get this thing voltage somehow, which is actually just going to come from the USB cable. So let's do it. Cool. First thing we're going to do is let's get power to the potentiometer, because we need to be able to give it power from the Arduino so that it can give us a signal back right. that get, then gets converted into some sort of value. So remember power, I can, I'm going to take it from ground mm -hmm. And voltage in, which gives me unregulated power. And it doesn't matter which side I put it on. I could have positive and negative or, uh, or positive and negative. Right. Yeah. So, OK. OK, so I'm going to go like that. And just to refresh like the way that. breadboards work is that one line is the Precisely. Connection. So the, uh, where is it? These are connected to, to those. This, that whole line is connected. Ah. It's, just, it's just a piece of metal underneath. All right, so I need to get this. This is the wiper. So that's the value that's going to change. When I change this potentiometer, mm -hmm. it's going to give me a value between 0 and 5. And that's the pin. We're going to be setting this to pin 0? Correct. Analog 0, which is right ah. there. So now I have a way to power the potentiometer, and I also have a way to get the value back from the potentiometer so it knows where it's going to get the value to set the animation. Cool. All right. Now let's go back to our code here. We've got, uh, we've got our potentiometer taken care of, but we need data pin 7 connected 
to the digital in on the LEDs. So let's let's do this. So do we have to cut some wires? I'm and... not going to cut. I, I would. Oh, you could, you can just use the pin. I'm going to be lazy and use jumpers. Well, it's better to test that way anyway. Yeah, I guess. exactly. So what I have is I have this. This is my uh, my digital input. Remember, I said the green one was digital in. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to put this jumper in there. It's kind of ghetto. Yeah. Uh, this is not a permanent installation. Please no. don't do this. Um, uh, and leave it. And leave it. Yeah. Just put some electrical such tape on it. a bad idea it. because yeah. all it takes is like it gets pulled and suddenly that piece of metal is contacting something else in the, mm. in the project box. Yeah. That's a bad thing. All right. So this goes to where? Uh, zero. Well, no. We got, we got oh, the Oh, seven. 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 Yeah, yeah, exactly. Whoops. So mm -hmm. digital pin seven, which is right It's on the other side. There. Yeah. Okay. So now I've got digital going in, but I need a ground here. Why do you need a ground there? Well, because this ground is isolated from that ground. Oh, okay. Right. So... So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and the ground is, is white. And, and then... I'm just going to add it to a, any ground any on ground, this board. Any ground, because there's a ground there. Yep. So we're going to put one right there. Okay. Cool. There we go. Okay. So this gives me an almost complete installation for this. Uh, I have a way to get power to the potentiometer. I have a way to get the value back from the potentiometer into the Arduino. I have a way to get the digital out into the digital in right. of the WS2812 strip. Now you just need power to the strip. Power! You gotta have power! Power, you bojo! Okay, so we're using this. This right. is this is a UBEC that I've already set for, uh, for 5 volts. Uh, there is a jumper on the back here. If you, there we go. So I can move this from there to there and get it to six volts. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, so just read the instructions. Make sure you've got it set for five volts. In fact, what I would do is if you've got a, a multimeter, and you really should have a multimeter if you're doing this. Where's our multimeter? Uh, Bert. <laughs> uh, <laughs> test it just to make just sure. Because okay. some of these actually have really poorly silk screened instructions on them. Okay. Sorry about that. But yeah, it's true. All right. So uh, I'm, again, I'm going to be cheap. I should. I should go ahead and uh, cut these and solder them. But I'm guessing you're going to use jumpers. I'm just going to no. You're just gonna I'm, use, not, I'm just no, going to put them straight jumpers. in. Okay, okay. How about that? So <laughs> white right here is ground. Okay. So, uh, and again, please don't do this in the real world because I swear this is just this is for testing purposes. This is to make sure that everything's working properly. You know? mm -hmm. But don't leave don't, it like this. Don't leave it like this. Oh, this is. I mean, oh, there's so much potential for bad things to happen right now. <laughs> I just, I Should just, I like stand back for a little while? Well, I mean, we don't have power applied, but yeah, okay. but we will. Here we go. Just don't don't breathe. Because <laughs> if those two wires touched, cross, we have a problem. Uh. Houston, we will have issues. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and give power to this Arduino. <laughs> Easy there. Just, just be really careful. Just don't don't move it too much. Okay. okay. And now we have uh, we're gonna power it off of this. This uh, this battery. So you've already have you updated the software on the Arduino from? Have you uh, sent the new parameters I, to it? I have, and we will look oh, at okay. the software in just a bit. So let's uh, go ahead and boop. There we go. So if you uh, bring the lights down a little bit. Ooh. Ooh. Pretty. All right. So this potentiometer, when I when I turn it, it actually changes the animation of the entire strip. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I said, so let's go from that to all the way this way. <laughs> Spiral. That's cool. Ooh. And all the way the other way. Off. And the, that's the fade. The fade to black. Yeah. That's cool. But I do not yet have the uh, the white loaded up on this. Before. Right. Because I'm I'm guessing this is the same profile you had for the goggles, so yeah, you haven't like I touched just, any ooh. of the. Actually, oh look at this one. This one's like cool. It looks cool. Actually, it's kind of cool in a spiral because it does that circular thing. Yeah. It's got the whole disc of Tron thing going on. That's really Actually, neat. that gives me a good idea for some Ooh. cosplay stuff. Ooh. Tron disc. Ooh. Okay, okay. So, okay. We're, sorry, sorry. So we, <laughs> Distracted by LEDs again. Mesmerized. Sorry about that. But we want to show you what we were talking about where you can supply power to this at multiple points. Mm -hmm. uh, because this is not, this is an issue. Since it's only 150 LEDs, I'm not, I'm not even coming close to stressing right. this, uh, this uh, uh, UBEC. Right. But if I was running a 300 LED string, I wouldn't want to run it off of one. So uh, then it, would you have just one connected to the other side? I would have one connected to the other side. Because if I ran it off of single one, it would probably work most of the time. But mm -hmm. if I ever cranked it to like full bright white, I'm now over-volting, over-amping over my UBAC, and I'm probably going to blow it up. Okay. Uh, okay. I mean, not immediately, but probably at a really inconvenient time. That's, that's, <laughs> right that's when you're the showing, law. 
You're showing all your friends and family. And <laughs> exactly. Look at my project. <laughs> Oops. Merry Christmas. We burned the house down. Oh. All right, so this is uh, this is uh, just another... Remember, remember this? We, we created this a while back. This mm -hmm. was my Arduino in a case. So I have a U-back in here that is actually supplying power both to an external source and to the Arduino. It's got a filter in here mm -hmm. located right there, which gives me clean power to the Arduino. So no matter what's happening on the outside link, I'm still getting nice, clean, consistent 5-volt power to, to the Arduino. Cool. Uh, I, I'm only going to use this. I'm not using the internal Arduino. I'm only using this as a second U-back because, again, I'm lazy and I didn't want to solder another one. But uh, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to connect black here. So this is ground. <laughs> which is white to black. Which is white to black. Because you know what? <laughs> we're all the same color, really. That's true. Yeah. That's true. I don't see color, Padre. Yeah. I, I, I'm glad Tay wasn't helping me to sol solder these together. <laughs> oh, poor racist Tay. Uh, that AI never had a chance. You didn't. You can't put that on the internet. We're going to mess with it. That's how that works. Okay. Uh, there we go. Easy now. Oh, gosh. Don't Wait, I have the, the other street. one. I have the other one unplugged, right? Uh, what do you mean, other one unplugged? The other power source? Okay. Oh. Wow, that is super jank. But, okay, let's plug it in. Okay. I might stand back a so little bit. not good. Okay, it's, it's, hold on. Uh, it's, I'm not making enough contact here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to do this, uh, Yeah, I'll just, I'll stand over here. It's okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. The problem is that it won't go in, in. It's like just touching. Uh, what I probably should have done is solder these. <laughs> that would have taken time. That would have taken time. And, but you know what? For, for our audience, don't you think they deserve it, Brian? They do deserve the, the, the chance of us hurting ourselves on, on camera. Well, now that you put it that way. <laughs> Actually, you know what I could do? I'm just going to take it off the internal breadboard. Yeah, how about that? Oh, yeah. getting crafty. That's what I do. <laughs> uh, oh, wait, no. I didn't oh. put an internal breadboard. I took it out of the last revision. Uh, okay. Uh, see, I oh, was too clever for myself. Oh, I, I, I kid, tell me not to touch that, please, because I don't want to disrupt that. Because when that I plug it looks in, looks like it'll be okay. It will. It will do very bad things. <laughs> okay. Ooh, that one's in. Okay. <laughs> you got I, have, ground in. I have you now, electronics. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Can I? Did I get close enough? Cursed by our own hubris. <laughs> Oh, don't touch them while it's plugged in. It makes me nervous. <laughs> it's going to explode. Okay. All right. And then I should be able to get this one at the same time, and it should light up. And, oh, I've lost the digital. Okay. Oh, here we go. Yes. Mm -hmm. We're good. We are good? Oh, right. You're going to twist the knob. <gasps> okay. Okay. Phew. For a second, there, I thought I was gonna about to blue smoke it. All right. So okay. bring the lights down. <laughs> All right, you'll notice, so I've got a power supply here, mm -hmm. and I've got a power supply here. So I'm going to connect this one. I've now got two power supplies giving power from either direction. And they're both going through the U-Beck? No, well, they, they have independent U-Becks. So oh, there's a U-Beck in one here, and there's there. a U-Beck in here. Okay. Two okay. different power supplies. Uh, now, I could be running a 12-volt line between them, or I could just be using two different adapters. Okay. I could have like a 19-volt adapter and a 12-volt adapter, and each U-Beck would be supplying power. Here's the cool thing, though. The LEDs, because of how resistance works, they're automatically going to, going to draw from the UBEC that's closest to them. Okay. That's just how, okay. well, I mean, more yeah. or less, it's not exact because yeah. the resistance will vary through the string. But it does mean that each UBEC is only going to have to do part of the work. And the way we know that is, look, I can disconnect this one and, and it still, still goes. Right. And I can disconnect this one. Careful. Don't touch mm. the wires. Mm. And it still goes. Ah, cool. cool right? Cool. So that's that's what we're looking for. This is the kind of redundancy that you can build into your system mm -hmm. if you have multiple power points. Right. But if it were a longer strand and one of these came out, then it would probably, like, half have, of it would go black. You'd have or... an issue. And you know what? That That's actually a good discussion during the design process. Mm -hmm. How much failure do you want to be able to tolerate? Because you can get higher current UBEX. You can, you can find yourself like a 10 amp UBEX, and if you can bring the lights up a little bit, uh, you can get 10 amp UBEX, but then it, it does, again, mean that you're pushing a lot of current through one side of the string. Do you really want to do that? Okay, cool. So if I wanted to do something where I could plug it into like a wall socket instead of battery power, I could, could I still use these UBEX? Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Do, okay. do something like this. So this, this case is just a project box. I actually have an AC adapter for this. Okay. So I can I, I can put an AC adapter to this, and I can get 20 amps out of the multiple UBEX I've got built into that case. Okay. Uh, but again, 
how do you want your, your device to be resistant? Yeah. Mm. Okay. Mm. All right. Now, when we come back, I'm going to show you some of the code things that we've done so that you can take this home and play on your own. Just one more quick go because we do want you to play with this. But before we do that, hey, you know what I want to do? What do you want to do? I, I want to go ahead and thank the sponsor of this episode of Know How. Is it Seamless pay Payments? Uh, oh, well, uh, I don't know if I could call them Seamless. I, I, I would call <laughs> Friction them... Friction-free? Freaking awesome, maybe. Or that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Folks, we want to thank Braintree for their support of Know How. Now, Braintree is the payment solution that you want to use. Uh, if, if you wanted to set up a payment solution for your, for your app, for your server, the old way was to make sure that you had a payment processor who you could contract with, make sure that your hardware was compliant. It had to be PCI compliant, because otherwise you're legally responsible for any breaches. And you also needed to make sure that the hardware that was running on was protected properly. You could do all that, and that's still a path you could take if you like working really hard for no reason. Or you could just go with Braintree, the easiest way to add payments to your app or service. By next year, maybe even next week, there could be a whole new way to pay. Maybe it will be the next Bitcoin or the next Apple Pay or maybe even both. Oh, if you did it that original way, you would have to make sure that uh, you, you adapted for it. You, you changed your payment process. You made sure that your software was up to date. Or, or you could use Braintree's full stack payment platform for an easy way to adapt to whatever the future holds so that you can adapt easily too. It lets you accept everything from pounds to PayPal to that next big innovation from any device with just one integration. And when that new payment method comes out, all you'll have to do is update a few lines of code. No late nights, no complicated recoding, no stress about staying ahead of the curb. Braintree Payments is here to help. The Braintree code supports Android, iOS, and JavaScript clients, and their SDK comes in seven languages, .NET, Node.js, Java, Perl, PHP, Python, and Ruby. It's elegant code with clear documentation, and they understand that, well, their service is going to be your front-facing uh, service face. So they make sure that they do it Right. They even offer you a sandbox so you can test your integration to make sure it's going to work right when it hits the real world. Braintree gives you an easy way to accept multiple payment types with one integration. Integrating it into your app is as easy as, as inserting a few lines of code. Why would you do it any other way? Learn more today at braintreepayments.com slash knowhow. That's braintreepayments.com slash knowhow. And we thank Braintree for their support of knowhow. All right, Brian, let's take a look at the code for this, uh, this quick project. Uh, again, if you go back to my screen, we've got all the basics. So this is uh, where we defined our pins. Right. Uh, we, this is where we defined our brightness and our frames per second. Now, remember, in this setup, I included a couple of debug lines. This is just like I've done for all of the other Arduino projects we've had before. Mm -hmm. You don't actually need any of this except this, the fast LED commands. Because the fast LED commands tell you how you're going to be handling the array. It, it tells you what it needs to set up in order to make this thing work properly. Mm -hmm. But the serial console commands are just so that I can see what's going on inside. In fact, let me show you okay. right now. So I'm going to open up a serial monitor. And when I change this, actually, there we go. There it is. So you're seeing the values that are coming from the, uh, the potentiometer. See, everything on the left-hand side, that's the raw value. And on the right-hand side, that's the remapped value. Because what I needed to do is I needed to map those between 0 and 6 so I could trigger seven different animations. So right. from 0 up to about, let's see, when does it turn to 1? Up to about, oh, there we go, we're back, go back, go back. To about 150, or oh, 120 is, uh, is zero. 0. Above that, it's 1. And then I get to 2 and yep. 3, 4. And the way that that happens is the remap function. Now, we're, we've played mm -hmm. with this before. Let's, let me go ahead and go down to the, the part in the code base that does that. And let's do it right the Because you didn't actually there. have to calculate. You didn't have to divide the range by 6. You no, just told it, it just whatever it. the range is. Yep, and makes see, here it is right now. So uh, my, my function called pattern, and this is the one that it calls to say, what pattern should I be playing? Ah. It does, it creates a variable called a read which is the analog read. Mm -hmm. So it reads from pot pin, which I set up above, right. as pot as zero, zero. But I could change it to any of them, any of the, mm -hmm. the analog uh, pins. It takes that, and that's the raw value. That was that value on the right-hand side. Mm -hmm. Then down below, it creates a new one called pat choice, pattern choice, and it uses the mapping function. And the mapping function says, for that value between 0 and 120, divide it between 0 and 7. Perfect. That's it. 
Yay? That's, yeah. Easy. No, that's cool. Boom. Okay. And that will allow me to choose the different animations that I've created. And then down below, uh, th this is all, uh, there's two that I've added. There's blank, which allows me to fade it to black. Right. Uh, I could just do off, but it's kind of cooler to have it fade. Yeah. Uh, and then down at the bottom, I added a function for pure white. And when, it's, when it goes to 7, which I don't have it set to do right now, mm -hmm. uh, it will turn all the LEDs to pure white, which I'm not going to do because I don't want to blow it up because, <laughs> because I don't have enough voltage going, uh, right, right. going into this. Can I look at one of the other patterns that you, you sure. programmed, though? Yeah. Uh, what do you want? Uh, well, it doesn't have to be plugged in on the, the source code. Oh, thing. sure. Okay, yeah. I want to see how you designed Which some one? of your patterns. Uh, well, see, that's the, this is the nice thing. These patterns, most for the most part, they yeah. are built into the fast LED library. Oh, okay. So, if you, so you look just at, copied the ones that you. Yep. You just found look cool. at the library and you say, "Oh, look! There was one called Fade to Black. That's so I did Fade to Black. There was one called uh, Rainbow. I called Rainbow. Uh, this uh, is confetti. Yeah. Okay. Right. I was I was trying to think of how you would uh, if you wanted to customize like the LED pattern, how you would do that. Oh, you can do that. Yeah. But see, what this allows me to do is it allows me to use an animation that someone else has created. I right. can I can totally make my own function to mm -hmm. do something crazy. But I would have to come up with a pattern. I see. So the, those are just right. calls to uh, the library? Precisely. Okay. And the ones that I did are the super easy ones. Fade to black, which just takes the array and it slowly fades it to nothing right. on the right. brightness. And then the white, which tail, takes all three values and it pushes them up to 255. Okay. In that, fact, here, look, at, like look at the white. See, the white, all it does is for the counter of zero up to the number of LEDs. So from the very first LED all the way to the very last LED, mm -hmm. make that that position in the array equal white. White, which is full power. That's full power. Full right. power! Full power. And then okay. it pushes it out to the string and we're done. Uh, okay, that's cool. Because I was thinking back to when I did, um, it was my little Pac-Man pendant. Right. And I had to program the mm -hmm. animations in it. And it was basically like one zero one zero zero one one one. Every one was a li lit up yeah. our, uh, LED and every zero was a blank LED. So You could do that. It would just take a really long time. Right, right. No, I don't think I'd do that for this, but that's cool that those are already pre-made and you just yeah. plug them in. Yeah. In fact, uh, if you look back to the example we first did when we had WS2812 Christmas lights, mm -hmm. I showed people how to manually create an array, but the array was only for 16 LEDs. Right. If I'm going to do 300 LEDs, I'm going to use a couple of loops in order to fill it up the way I want it, right. rather than me having to manually enter every single value, especially... <laughs> yeah. If I'm going to animate it, because that would have to do several different values of arrays. And, yeah, you know, it, get, it would get complicated. That would be annoying. Okay. Right. Very neat. So I think that we've spent enough time on uh, WS2812. Let's go ahead and move on to the, the next one. Cool. All right. The next question comes from Ron. He asks, Father Robert, I need to upgrade my hard drives on my archive NAS to two terabyte drives. Uh, currently, I am using a one terabyte Western Digital Green. What's the hard drive you would choose for this upgrade? I'm glad you asked. This is actually a question we had two years ago. This was in episode 80 of Know How. Oh. We're on episode, what, 201? 201 it's 201 never too now. late to ask a question. No, no, no. This, this is question. good. It, you, know, you bring back the knowledge that's probably gotten buried in, in the older episodes. Oh, Alex, you've got a video here of, uh, of me taking the temperatures on a Seagate Barracuda, mm -hmm. a green and a red. Now, the Seagate Barracuda, I've been running all these at the same time, is going to be in open air was running around, what, 90 or so degrees. It's a little on the warm side, especially if you're going to put that into a NAS enclosure. It doesn't like that. A green is cooler. It's going to be going down to about 84 degrees, but the red will drop me all the way down to about 75 degrees. Hmm. That may not sound like a much from uh, a big difference from, from 90 to 85 to 75, but if you're going to put it inside an enclosed area with very and then little... stack it with yeah, other hard drives. It makes a huge difference. Yeah. So that's why I go with the red. The temperature is your enemy. Heat will kill your drives faster than anything else. Uh, so, and not only that, when you think about it, Western Digital Black would be nice. You have a black. I that's think, what I use in my PC. My, but that's what I use for my OS and my games. Right. But a NAS, most likely your NAS is limited to gigabit Ethernet, yeah. which means that you're never going to take advantage of the speed of mm -hmm. a black. Get a red. A red will last longer. It's been specifically designed to live in a NAS, and uh, you'll, you'll get actually a, a much higher capacity for less price than a Western Digital Black. So why uh, would you want a green then? A green I would use inside of a single PC. I wouldn't use it in a NAS. It's not. It's actually a really bad NAS drive because mm. it will spin down on its own. Okay. But if I wanted a drive that I could like pull out and use for long-term storage, I am all over green. Okay. Although cool. I think now they offer blue. Alex, do you know what blue is for? Is blue the media version? 
or I, I, can't. I don't remember. Yeah, they, they've got a couple now. They've got it's black, green, like blue, blue, is and like red. level below black. Right. Uh, okay. What do we use for our videos that we archive? I think we have greens. We have it's a, a green. bunch of greens. The, that in the cottage we use greens. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So there you have it. Uh, pick yourself up some Western Digital Reds. Uh, they've got four terabyte right now. I think they're releasing a five. So it's pretty crazy how cheap yeah. you can get terabyte storage these days. For a year ago, we got a uh, Seagate, a super enterprise drive, because it was six terabytes. Right. And now you can buy that on consumer level. So, mm. yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> All right, what do we got next? All right, the next one comes from Rud Dog. Rud Dog. And he asks, is there a wireless system which allows me to use my perfectly great bookend wired speakers? I would like to be able to plug a transmitter into the jacks on the TV and then have each bookend speaker connected to a receiver plug. Uh, the main problem is that this is powered, but they would be close to 115 volts outlet? Yeah. Hmm. Um, actually, this is not as big of a problem as you think it is. Um, okay. What you're looking for is a way to go from a jack, probably a 3.5 millimeter jack, to wireless, and then a way to go from wireless to your speakers. Okay. And that's actually really cheap. Uh, really? Look at this. So we've got a link here, Alex. The Anchor Bluetooth Transmitter. I'm only bringing this up because this is relatively inexpensive, but there are literally dozens of these. Ooh. This will take any source, any 3.5 millimeter source. Actually, you can adapt it up to a quarter inch if you want to. Mm -hmm. And it will push it out over Bluetooth. And then any Bluetooth compatible device, be it speakers or whatever, will be able to take that signal and turn it back into analog. Awesome. Yeah. But... He gave, he gave us a wrinkle, and the wrinkle what? was that he has existing bookshelf speakers that he likes, oh. and he wants to use them. And I'm assuming that they're self-powered, because if they're not self-powered, then you would need a receiver right. in order to, to provide power to them. So you get something like this. And again, this is an example that we're using because it was sitting inside the, <laughs> no, in the before you buy office. Um, but this is called the Rocky. This is a Bluetooth device. So you, you, uh, you program it to access a Bluetooth network. Okay. You pair it with the device, yeah. and then you get a 3.5 millimeter out. Uh, so oh. all you'd have to do is push that into the speaker, and now you have a wireless connection. Nice. Uh, and again, this will run you about twenty to thirty dollars. So all told, you could be looking at about sixty bucks, and that gives you a Bluetooth wireless setup that interfaces with your wired setup. Cool. No, that's yeah. awesome. Pretty easy, yeah. Pretty easy. That's not too too shabby. That okay. that seems like a. A fairly elegant solution. You don't have a bunch of cables going everywhere. And, and fairly stuff. inexpensive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You could do a custom uh, installation. Actually, we could probably do something with an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi, mm -hmm. but I would just as soon get an off-the-shelf. It's cheaper than it's a, cheap. a Raspberry Pi. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. What do we got next? Okay. Uh, we've got a power my servo tester. Ooh. Okay. All right. Brian asks, I have a quick question. Do I need a voltage regulator between the battery and this servo controller? I can't get my motors to spin up, but they make a nice sing song when I <laughs> plug the main battery in. Hmm. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, so let me give you a little, a little bit of background on this. Uh, he actually plugged the 12 volts directly into the servo tester. Oh. Which means he no longer has a servo tester. Uh, by servo tester. It doesn't like that. It, uh, <laughs> Does you, it please you to see me die? <laughs> you do need a UBAC, which thankfully we already played with. So you need one of these. Again, okay. buy yourself a couple because they're great for projects. But you'll notice it has a little plug on one end. That plug goes into the input of your servo tester like ah. so. Actually, if you go to the side view here, you'll notice that, oh, well, it's kind of too small. You'll see signal plus and minus. Okay. You see that? Yeah. Signal plus, so minus is down at the bottom. So I just make sure that it does that. Oh, my pins are all bent. <laughs> there we go. Okay, now if I connect power to this, I will see the lights turn on without the smoke. So that means this server tester is ready to go. So uh, the, way we're, the way we're gonna test oh, it is we're actually gonna hook it up to a servo. Okay. Uh, here, you hold that. That's, that's your My little servo thing. prop. Yeah. So I'm gonna hook this up so signal is at the top. <gasps> Look at him go. And now, uh, actually, go to the side view here. Ooh, Ooh look at that. It's like oh. magic. It's witchcraft. Nice. Yeah. So you do need a UBEC, uh, unless, unless you're hooking this up to an ESC that has a UBEC built into it. How um, would you know? Is well, it just... because like they have that third wire. Oh, OK. Uh, like, but the ones that we were using on, on Project FPV 150, they did not have a BEC built into them. They were opto. 
so they did not supply power back from the power source that they were receiving. Okay. Um, one other thing to, to notice this, because you, you mentioned the sing song, the sing song will sometimes happen when you plug it in and you're like set for middle voltage. It actually wants you to take it back down to no voltage. Oh, okay. And it's a safety feature so that it doesn't just suddenly like spin, <laughs> especially if you have a prop attached. You don't well, want that happening. like we talked about, if you're testing your, your motors, do not have props on them. Yeah, yeah. So speaking of props, next up, uh, we do have a lot of questions about quadcopter related stuff. I did not want to bring this up on Monday because people get really sensitive about that. So we're going to handle them. But before we do that, Brian, let's take one more break to thank another sponsor of this episode of Know How. And uh, well, it's one of my favorite because it helps me to put my projects on the internet. A server, an app, maybe just a website that I need to get up really, really quickly. If you want to do that, and if you want to have a way that's just, just the easiest way I've ever found to, to put up the latest and greatest thing that I've created, you want DigitalOcean. Now, DigitalOcean uses droplets. These are containers, a way to take that service, that server, that app, that website, and put it into a self-contained, well, a container that, that you can run on DigitalOcean's infrastructure. Now, the cool thing about this is the scalability. I can run it for a couple of minutes on a very, you know, decent set of specs and then open it up to the rest of the world once I know that it's ready to handle the traffic. DigitalOcean is used by over 600,000 developers, including Twitch Randall Schwartz, Aaron Newcomb, and myself. It lets us deploy and configure our droplets via a streamlined control panel or an API so we can do automation. I get to select my OS, Ubuntu, CentOS, Debian, Fedora, CoreOS, and FreeBSD, and I can select from one of the many pre-configured one-clicks like Drupal, Docker, or Node.js to get up and running quickly or build the exact infrastructure that I want with root access to servers running 100% SSDs and state-of-the-art data centers around the world. DigitalOcean is scalable. I've already talked about this, but it is important because it means I can grow or shrink as needed. My example is the Minecraft server that I built. It's a, it's a, a droplet that allows me to put up at any time I want a high availability server running Minecraft so I can host a small party. Now, if it's just going to be a few of us, I, I choose one level. If it's going to be an open server and I'm expecting hundreds of users, I choose a larger one. But it's the same droplet, I just subscribe to more resources. That's the beauty of the droplet. Now, DigitalOcean also has an extremely active community with a large and detailed set of tutorials on all the ways that you can use your droplet. This is exciting because it means that they have users who love the service, love the service enough to come back and help new users do with it what they want to do. If you are looking to deploy a new project, if you are looking for the future of infrastructure, or if you're just a geek who likes the ability to stand up projects with next to no need to build your own infrastructure, DigitalOcean is for you. It's so easy to get started that you can deploy an SSD cloud server in as little as 55 seconds. Here's what we want you to do. We want you to try DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean has incredibly affordable and straightforward pricing with servers starting at just $5 per month. There's also hourly pricing available starting at less than a penny per hour. But we're going to make it so that you can get started today and deploy an SSD cloud server for free. Just visit DigitalOcean.com and create an account. Once you confirm your email and account information, go to the billing section and enter the promo code KNOWHOW for a free $10 credit. That's plenty to get started and explore what DigitalOcean can do for you. Again, that's DigitalOcean.com. DigitalOcean.com. And once you sign up, Enter the code KNOWHOW in the billing section to get your $10 credit for free. And we thank DigitalOcean for their support of KnowHow. All right, Brian, let's get to the, uh, the quadcopter stuff. And this first one is actually very, very important. I, I want to clear this up, and I, I, want, I want this to be open and on the record. Mm -hmm. What do we got? All right, Mr. Rockenbach asks, what is a good alternative to RTF quads? Okay. Which is ready-to-fly quads. Ready-to-fly quads. And this goes on. And actually, uh, there have been a couple of users who, uh, and actually one of them was really, really mad. He was really upset, basically accused me of shilling and selling out, but... Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. What, were I, you I saying that. nice things about me again? Is that it? That would never be true. Oh, okay, thank goodness. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, but some people have had issues with orders from ready-to-fly quads, and actually, the very first time we ever use RTFQ, I told people, this is not a big business. This is yeah. one guy... And the reason why I like to throw business his way is because he's done so much for the sport. I mean, right. he was one of the first pioneers. He was the one who, he's always... He's an enthusiast, He's right? an enthusiast. He's very happy to help people and newbies. He's gotten flooded, and I think that's actually partially our fault because oh. we've been throwing a lot of business his way. I see. We don't get a kickback. 
We don't get paid by Ready to Fly Quads. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't get freebies from Ready to Fly Quads. In fact, when I order for, for the know-how projects, I actually use a different name and different address so he doesn't know it's me. And I've always had incredible service. And in fact, there was only one time that I had a wait of over a week. Um, and mm -hmm. that was for some of, some of the FPV gear. He's been very, very responsive. But some people, and I get this, I understand, I'm not, I'm not denigrating your experience. Some people don't like um, being made to wait. And mm -hmm. I, I know he could be a little better about answering questions. So, yeah, well, if he's doing this as like something that he enjoys, it's not like he has a huge yeah. like, army behind him helping him out. Yeah. I mean, there's other options too if, you, if you're that impatient, I but, guess. Right? But I understand the people who don't want that. Because, yeah. I mean, some people are like, well, that's nice and all, but. I paid for something I wanted. Mm -hmm. and, totally legit. Okay, so I, I'm not making fun of you, mm -hmm. uh, but I do want to give you alternatives. I will try. I will try to start including other links to the same gear. But unfortunately, a lot of this is sort of one-off stuff. It's things that only RTFQ has, or RTFQ has for a much better price. Mm. Uh, but here are a couple of the alternatives, and Alex, the links are down below. Uh, the first one is getfpv.com. This is actually a really good resource. If you want to get FPV gear, which RTFQ is not the fastest to get, that's actually a good place. So fpv.com, decent prices. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a larger company, so you'll see that uh, you know they come on a, a bit faster. And uh, I think, Alex, you probably have that link for uh, getfpv.com. Um, Sorry. Well, I know. There we go. Oh, okay. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Uh, and and you know, they have they have a lot of the parts. They have frames. They have motors. They have receivers. Uh, they are in the United States, uh, and they do ship relatively quickly. Okay. Uh, so that, that's one. My second is mo multi motor mania. Mo multi rotor mania dot com. Ah. Uh, I actually prefer getfpv.com over this, but these they actually they have some good deals. So if you're if you're one of these people who likes to shop around for deals, this is a good one to use. Um, and they will have a lot of parts from everything from the 150 class all the way up to the, the huge monsters. I do like their title. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Motor, <laughs> Multimotor multi Mania. It's, I feel like they're, Macho Man Randy Savage is going to pop through the screen or something with a quad in his hand. Yeah, exactly. Now, there is one, there's only one place that I trust for batteries. You'll mm -hmm. notice that any time I've, I've specified batteries, it comes from Hobby King. Uh, it's a source I trust. You will pay a little bit more. Uh, especially for shipping, they do have a warehouse in East United States and the West United States now, so it's not as bad as it used to be where you had to order everything from Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not just batteries. They actually have some really, really good gear. If you wait around for the deals, you'll probably find something inexpensive. Hmm. So, yeah, there are all, they're all alternatives, and I, I, will, I will mention those more and more if I can. Sure. Um, but it's just internationally, I have an affinity for Paul. I, I know there's a lot of people who are really angry with him right now, and get it. I totally get it. It's just I kind of want to support someone who is mm -hmm. doing something for something that I really love. Do you have any recommendations for people who live outside the U.S.? If or? you live outside of the United States, the only one I would trust would be Hobby King. Okay. They actually have experience with delivering outside of the United States. Okay. Um, and, and again, you know, they're a bigger company, so they're going to be more responsive. They actually have a staff who can get back to you right away. Yeah. Uh, you, for me, I will probably still keep ordering from RTFQ. Okay. I mean, I kind of ran into this problem, too, when uh, I was doing my Game Boy project, and a lot of that stuff was just one-off kind of kits and things, and yeah. it was like a bunch of these little websites where... It was just a guy who was an enthusiast, bought up a bunch of these parts and then started building stuff. Yep. And then I think you remember the email I got back from them was like, oh, we have a, a printing problem. Right. So you're not going to get your part for like another 30 days. Sorry. And it was like uh, the toner went bad and we couldn't like, print invoices. Like, OK, mm, you know what? If you just be lie to me a bit better. Yeah. I mean, I don't have a problem <laughs> with getting stuff late as yeah. long as the person who's selling it says like, hey, you know, it's going to yeah. be late. I'll be up front with you and tell you why. Yeah. But this is also why we've always announced our parts list like a month in advance. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because we know that this has been an issue. Uh, but. Uh, I'm not going to make fun of you. I, 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 I know you have a legitimate complaint, so we'll, we'll just move on. Hopefully you understand now. Cool. All right. Well, moving on to the next this, question. Yeah, oh, this is exciting. All right, this one comes from Scott. He asks, just watched episode 195, and I was very interested in the eBay kit mentioned to be in the show notes, but there are no show notes as far as I can tell. Mmm, yes. But he wants to do a competitive build. We are going to be doing this competitive, competitive build. Unfortunately, this is an eBay kit again, mm -hmm. and the link that I, I put in is dead. But here it is. So uh, look for it. This is the, look for the Diatone 150. 
We will put this link in the show notes again. I'm sure it will be dead within two weeks. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so less than $90, what this is going to give you is it's going to give you a 150 frame. It's going to give you a mini flip 32 controller, which is perfect for this size, but it is PPM. So okay. if you have a PWM controller, you're going to want to get a PWM to PPM converter. Right. It's got four of those uh, ESCs, the Emacs Nano, uh, Nano 12 amp opto ESCs. Are those the same ones we've been... No, these are not as good, but these will support both Blue okay. Heli and Simon K firmware. Cool. Uh, and they'll also give us props. So it's it's cheaper. That's a good kit. It's a good kit. About $30 cheaper than what we paid from, from RTFQ. Mm -hmm. The parts are actually pretty good. I do trust Emacs for, for the most part. Um, and uh, you've got a kit, and I've got a kit, and you can go buy yourself a kit for about $90. All you'd have to do is add the radio and the battery, and then you can competitive build along with us. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So, okay, so just search that title then. Diatone the, the link's not going to be there. Yet. Yeah, so, and unfortunately, that's, that's why I prefer to link to Amazon, even though sometimes Amazon's more expensive, because mm -hmm. it will probably still be there. eBay, those, they will last until their inventory's gone. So, okay. and a lot of you will watch our episodes six, seven, ten weeks after we've put them up, and those links are no longer good. Sorry hmm. about that. Well, that's that, a lot of stuff to keep track lot. of. That is a whole lot of work. I mean, I guess, should I mention where you would find those links if you were yeah. interested in no, looking don't, stuff up? Don't care. Don't care? Don't care. Oh, would it be twitch.tv oh, okay, slash, yeah. slash KH? How about that? Oh, that's weird. Where all our episodes live. Where is that again, Brian? Twit.tv slash KH. Oh, uh, look at those. I mean, look at those thumbnails. I'm just I know, excited. Right? I, I just want to see all those I things. I spend a lot of time figuring out which thumbnail <laughs> will make super, us look the worst. Super ghetto FD 150. <laughs> Did you even cut the uh, tips off of those zip ties? Nope. No, that's how I fly. Why do that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but as you can see, you can scroll down, uh, subscribe to the, uh, the video of your choice, and download, and also all the links are in the show notes for things that we talked about during the episode. Yeah, there you go. And uh, also, you can find us on the Google Plus thing that yeah. they do. Yeah, well, that's where we got all these questions from today. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be on the show, that's the best place to, to put it. Put your questions, put your projects, pictures, videos, anything you want to, to show off or questions that you might have, that's where you go. Again, Brian, where did they find that? They, we, they can use the link, gplus.to slash... Twit KH. I <laughs> have to think about that every time. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, if you're already on Google Plus, just search Know How and look for uh, that guy's face. Yeah, yeah. Well, although it should be changing. Uh, it right? should be changing so soon. No faces. It should be changing soon. Except uh, I did, I did a quick mock-up, and Anthony pointed out that I had raised the black bar at the bottom, <gasps> which is a no-no. Mm -hmm. So I have to redo. Can we just my... replace my face with a corgi face? Uh, yeah, we could probably Let's do, that. do that. Let's do a cartoon corgi yeah, face, though. I like that. <laughs> also, don't forget that you can find us on the Twitters. I am uh, twitter.com slash Padre SJ. And I am at cranky underscore hippo. Uh, that's the best place to find us, best place to find out what we're going to be doing, and best place to suggest future projects. You can also find our director, a, a good man who actually gave up a concert tonight to, uh, <laughs> to will make us be late, uh, Alex Gumpel. And I will say his name right this time, A-N-E-L-F-3, an L-3 at Twitter. He's a gentleman uh, and a scholar. He's a gentleman and a scholar. And please say thank you, folks, because he stayed late to help us do this. The opening act is starting right about now. <gasps> I'm sorry. The actual concert is in an hour and 15 minutes. Maybe, maybe you can make maybe it. Maybe I can make it to Oakland. No. Oh. Oh. No. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Balliser. And I'm Brian Burnett. And now that you know how, go miss a concert. I mean, go build something. <laughs> <laughs>